the for me for instance as an example as a batter what was important to know and communicated well was one where was i going to bat in that in that uh, batting order what is my role within that batting order and it doesn't matter how experienced i am as a coach uh my my philosophy on this as a coach you can never and it comes back to your your quote you can never just assume that a player understands what his role is irrespective of of how experienced he is i think it's always important to make sure that you you still find a way to facilitate the conversation just to reinforce maybe they just need a reminder on certain things or clarity clarification on certain things and i think that's that's an important one um and then it's also about understanding your role but also understanding what's your role in different conditions are you going to be down the order are you going to be playing different roles um you know i often uh, particularly in one day cricket there was a time where i batted at number 7 and i needed to understand what was my specific role there as opposed to batting 4 or 5 um and that that was an important part of that communication in understanding the game plan and tactic on that specific surface you mentioned role definition there jaits and i think um not only is it important for you to understand your role but i think the others in your teammates around you to right. understand your role and their role and mm. um and i think and i can use this example if if the game plan is is that right we're going to sweep on a turning wicket okay obviously your execution has to be important but as long as the guys around you understand that that is the game plan and if someone gets out trying to do it there can't be a um you know an orgy bargy in the change room or anything like that because guys are very clear on their roles so i think role definition is certainly one of them um the way you train is another way of 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 kind of uh you know implementing that that those roles and how you train Mm. And then uh, you spoke about different coaches and what I want to bring up on the screen is I've got a a few different coaches on yeah but obviously from different sports too because I think you know yes they different sports and game plans and tactics change but actually um it's amazing how sometimes various sports can be very similar to what we're trying to do now if I take someone like a Pep Guardiola yeah and and I don't bring him up because I'm a Man City fan I can promise you I bring him up because I I respect his his um his record first and foremost as a coach but his game plan you know they 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 generally they're an attacking team um and and I enjoy watching them play and even though I'm a man united fan I actually enjoy watching man man city play and I and I really respect what he does and it looks like he has a fantastic rapport with his players he's constantly trying to coach he he looks like he loves the game and that comes through in his body language the next guy I've got up there is again um someone I probably shouldn't have up there and Mr. Jurgen Klopp from Liverpool I'm a Man United fan but I just love his energy and his passion you know and I watch these guys coach uh, well not I don't watch them coach but I see how they are in terms of their body language on the field and I look at them and I go that's definitely someone I I would want to play for um key for me is looking into into why those players might want to play for him what sort of attributes does he have and it's incredible that are quite more often than not these game plans you know come out. The next guy I'm going to bring up is is not a coach specifically it's a um it's an actual player. Uh he he's goes by the name of Bryson DeChambeau and for those of you who love golf he um what he's done is remarkable in terms of 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 changing changing himself uh during lockdown he went and added three stone of white um and he, he his whole philosophy behind it was he wanted to hit the golf ball further. he wanted to win majors not just normal golf tournaments and he went away and and trained specifically ate a whole bunch of food which he was was um obviously uh uh helped with from a nutritionist to eat to be able to put on weight drinks nine protein shakes a day crazy stuff anyway went away and worked on his swing speed and he now swings the the golf club at 200 miles per hour he went across to the US Open um hit only 28% of fairways which is the lowest percentage of fairways anybody's ever hit in an open championship and he still went on and won the tournament because of his his distance he had off the tee so he felt he could over, overpower golf courses and that's his game plan and strategy and philosophy that he's gone with very risky to do at the highest level but you've got to admire the guy for pulling it off so that's why I wanted to uh to put him on there um the next one I've got up there is I don't know if many of you have watched the the series the last dance um it's on Netflix it's about the the incredibly successful Chicago Bulls era that they had and I'm specifically make mention of the relationship between uh, Phil Jackson and um and Michael Jordan the the relationship there the coach player relationship Michael being a massive leader within that team 
and just the way Phil managed that team at that time. Uh, there's a fantastic story that I also want to share about um, when uh, Dennis Rodman was allowed to go away for a couple of days to Vegas. And um, and they at that time, the, the team thought that that might be a little bit of a, a dangerous thing to be allowing because Dennis tends to go off the rails more often than not. Anyway, Dennis went and wasn't found after two days and, 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 and rocked back into the team environment four or five days later. But more importantly, how full and how the rest of his teammates handled that situation, I think was was kudos to their to their environment and and to the way that they handled and managed players at that time. So I just wanted to make mention of that. This next guy is probably the most successful IPL coach at the moment. He's gone away and won another title with the Mumbai Indians. JP, you, you might have a, know a thing or two about that team. Um, I think, uh, you know, what he's gone away and done and also watched a documentary on him is, is the way he, he fills his players with confidence, allows him to play with freedom, as we often speak about, but more importantly, has put a game plan and a tactic together that which has undoubtedly worked for them and created success. And that's ultimately what we want to be doing. And then the last one, just, just before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, is this man, Rassi Erasmus. Um, I mentioned Chasing the Sun documentary yesterday, obviously uh, the last coach to win a World Cup with the Springboks. Um, and the, the reason I put him up is I think the culture and the environment that he had to work in just goes to show that it can be done, even with probably the most diverse culture in the world and the most diverse um, environment in the world in terms of race, religion, whatever else it might be. He managed to bring a group of players together to play for a common cause and to, to go on and win a, a World Cup trophy. And I think um, there's a lot to be said about uh, the, the things that he did. Another good documentary to go and watch Chasing the Sun. So, so that's just a couple of different people, JP, that you talk about. Um, that have gone on and, and done great things in the coaching world and have obviously had fantastic game plans and tactics. Mm. Yeah, and, and I, I wanted to almost mention the <clears throat> Mahela Jawardena. Obviously, I had a, the opportunity to play under him and play alongside a few of those legends of the game, in particularly in the T20 format. And and, and the the important thing to mention is game plan and tactics. When it came to Mumbai Indians, they had a specific game plan that they believed in and 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 the interesting about that it it wasn't necessarily only Mahela that was part of that process the owners were front runners in putting together a philosophy and a tactic and a game plan of very specific of who they want to try and get and yes it is possibly i mean they have the the means of it and um you know they were very intentional with that but they they did so much uh, research and uh, understood players and, and, and how were they going to fit into this puzzle piece that they wanted to put together, which was pretty awesome to actually see and unfold. And if you look at just uh, if you look back into this last uh, tournament now, how they built everything around their middle order, you know, and that, that was an amazing thing to see how from a game plan and a tactic point of view, how that came to, to fruition in terms of uh, execution. So they had the freedom at the top and then they knew that they could rely on their big hitters at the bottom to get them out of jail if need be, but also finish off the innings. And obviously they had world-class bowlers as well. So, I mean, it took a, took a while for them to get that perfect uh, sort of playing 11, the, the essentially who they were looking for, but they mastered that art now and, and they're going to be a force to reckon with uh, for IPLs to come, I reckon. Definitely. So that, that leadership group uh, that you mentioned probably uh, also goes into probably stakeholder relationships, which we're going to cover in tomorrow's webinar, mm. is vitally important because ultimately what you want to do as a coach is you want to leave a legacy. Yeah. Um, and we spoke yesterday about the, the coach not being the system, the system being the coach. Mm. And um, that for me is a good system. So whoever replaces Mahela coming into that system, well, obviously, hopefully there will be that continued uh, success that, that that he's brought in because he's been surrounded with such a good leadership group. Mm. So it's a really good example to use, Jobs. And obviously going into stakeholder management tomorrow, we can we can touch more on that. Yep. I've had a couple of questions here, guys. And and um, and Mr. Jan Foster from uh, from JV Cricket Coaching. I know Fossey very well. Um, he's, a, he's a he's an old friend of mine. Welcome, Fossey. Good to have you on here. Um, he says I have a me I have a methodology and a philosophy that a player should be empowered and assisted to represent him or herself in the purest and authentic way that is a, a complement and extension of his or her personality within a team environment. When expected to act outside your comfort zone, empower, educate, advise the player has a good understanding of what is expected, or be it outside the norm of what is usually expected from the player. So I think a very valid point that I want to make mention of there, Fossey, is you've obviously 
empowered your players really well. And what you're doing is you're passing over responsibility to them. Um, what they do with that responsibility is then obviously on, onus to them about how they repay it back to you as a coach and to the system and to themselves. And I think that's a great way of managing players and, and, um, and coaches. So well done on that. Yeah, well done, man. That's awesome. <clears throat> okay, guys, we're going to move into, into what I um, and JP feel is, a, is, is identifying a game plan. It's a bit of a five-step process. Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you follow these five steps more often than not, you're going to, you're going to come out with, with hopefully a, a really good desired outcome. Um, the first one is vision. Uh, you've got to have a vision to be able to start something off. You've got to be able to have an end goal in mind. Um, the second thing is strategy and tactics. Uh, the third thing is planning, and we're going to go into these in more detail. The fourth thing is, is, is about teamwork, actually physically as a group getting down and working together as a team. Um, and then the fifth thing is training, and, and, and training will ultimately uh, determine how your, your vision and your strategy and your game plan, kind of the outcome of that. In terms of vision, okay, I've got a few things you can ask. And, and, and for you to have a vision, I think the first thing you need to really identify is where are you as a team? Um, where are, are you currently? What have you got at your disposal? How is your team currently playing? How is your team currently performing? And until you have a real understanding of that, I don't think you will be able to get your vision and your philosophy across. Um, you might walk into many different environments and you might have to do very many different things as a coach and you're going to have to adjust your ways. Something else, a nice way of thinking about it is what does the ending look like? So you have a vision. Obviously, Rassi Arasis' vision was to, to win the World Cup. Okay? That was his vision. That was his goal. That's what he dreamt of. That's what he saw. But you've got to be able to see what that looks like to be able to work backwards. The other thing I think I must make mention of is, is, is identifying what that process might look like. Um, it's about going through a step-by-step -step process, going from where your team currently is, and following a process to, to ultimately achieve that vision. I think you also need to look into what support you might require because I can guarantee you that you can't do it on your own. As much as we all like to believe that, um, that we can achieve great things on our own, um, you're only as good as your, your team around you and your support network around you. And I think it's about um, empowering people around you to also bring out themselves and to align themselves with your philosophy. Important to once you've identified all of these things I've mentioned, the, the most important thing for me is actually get it done. Put, put words into action. And quite often I've, I've heard some, some coaches be, be really good talkers and I haven't seen a hell of a lot of action. So for me, it's about make sure you walk the talk and make sure you put into action exactly what your plan might be. Jopes, going through that in terms of vision, I'm sure there are many coaches you've worked with. Mm. Who, who, who in your career would have been a visionary? Who, who is that? Who are a couple of coaches that maybe had this fantastic vision and they were able to, to, to bring that vision out of you as players? Yeah, two come to mind. Uh, Gary Kirsten, um, Shukri Conrad was my domestic uh, coach. They were, they very much were, were, were visionaries, particularly from a team context and, and an individual context. So, um, you know, I think, and just to, to come into to what's in front of us here, the vision, the vision for me, it's almost, and we talk about that thought, the third point there, what does the process look like? Um, so we know that the vision is obviously having an end in mind. And as you mentioned, they're working your way back and then uh, focusing on the process. And I believe in many ways, two, three, four, and five almost epitomizes the, the, the process. In, and, and obviously we're going to, we're going to unpack that a lot more. But what was important is identifying that vision, right? What does that look like? And now we, we're obviously working our way back. But importantly, what support do we need for that? And your fourth point there is that identifying who's going to walk this journey alongside us. But also in terms of your vision, if, you, if, if Rusty Erasmus goes and says, I want to win a World Cup, what's almost the next step from that is, right, how do we, be, how do we believe we're going to do that? What style of rugby are we going to play? Right, so let's put it into cricketing terms. If you're going to win a World Cup, let's look at England, 2015. Right, so so they they get knocked out pretty early. All of a sudden, they uh, they got new leadership, a new captain. Right, we want to operate in a certain way. We want to play a certain brand and style of cricket. 
right? So we need to get those players in that we believe are going to uh, sort of play that type of cricket and style of cricket quite naturally and fluently. Um, and then also guys that want to come in need to understand the brand of cricket that we're going to play. So, I mean, these, this is a, a sort of high level example. Again, we can obviously tailor, tailor that according to the level that you're playing at. But I think that's, that's the important thing for me is as a visionary, you must be able to not just have the vision of saying, I, I want to win a World Cup. There's got to be different levels and layers to that that you've already seen. And now you bring in people or having conversations with the team of how you believe that you can do that. And you're going to learn on the way. There's a process to this. Uh, you think about England, a four-year process. You think about uh, South African rugby. There was a two, two and a half year process to that. So it takes time. And we gotta, you got to be patient with it. But the important thing is to have the strategy and tactics, the planning, and then your, your teamwork and training becomes, becomes an important part of that. So, yeah, you, you, you're right in saying that those are really, really crucial uh, important points uh, to to ultimately achieve the desired outcome there. I think just just on your your point you mentioned there about England, right? So it gets just gets me thinking. So when Trevor Bayless came into that environment, um, yeah. it would be very interesting to know some of the tough conversations he might have had, um, dropping even some senior players mm. in that team to ultimately get his vision across in the t 2019 World Cup. I think the key to that is remember it's a vision. And it doesn't happen straight away. There is a process. There is a time frame that it takes to happen. So I think um, you know, no one. It's you know, coaching isn't like a, a magic act. Uh, David Copperfield pulling out a rabbit out the hat. I think there's a process that needs to take place, mm. and it obviously takes a bit of time to build up trust with 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 your team too. And mm. and for me, that's a big word, trust. Yeah. In terms of the next step, strategy and tactics. Um, this is where once you've had your vision, you now need to start putting your strategy and your tactics into play. Okay? First thing you need to look at is what are the real strengths of, strengths of my squad? What do I have at my disposal in terms of a skill set, maybe specifically? Maybe my team is um, an incredible runners between the wicket, as an example. Maybe they're a great fielding team. Maybe they need to become a better fielding team, for, as an example. Or maybe that isn't a strength within the team. But in terms of strengths, try identify what are those current strengths in your team and how are you going to utilize and maximize those strengths within your team? The other thing you can ask yourself is what can we deliver to give us the competitive advantage? Now, what I mean by that is I just mentioned fielding. So, so um, I see Paul's back on, on online again. And again, Paul, um, not to give away too many secrets, but again, in, in coaching, there's, there's no secrets in my opinion. We all talk about the same things and we're all trying to get the same results you know at scotland we've identified that um a non-negotiable for me is fielding and fitness and and i think that is something we can control and for me that is how i feel we can get a competitive advantage within the whether that's the associate world or playing against a full member that's where we can get an advantage even if we might be a little bit lacking on the batting or the bowling side of things in terms of a direct skill um that we might be lacking maybe we don't have a left arm quick bowler, as an example. Everybody wants a Mitchell Stark within their team. But for whoever we might be lacking from a skill set point of view, we want to make sure that we can try top it up in other areas in our squad. And that could be fitness, that could be fielding, just, just as an example. Uh, the other thing where that, that comes into play is selection. And, um, and JP, I'm going to throw this over to you uh, just, just after I've gone through it quickly is the key thing to selection, and I spoke about Trevor Bayless having some tough conversations, is it's, it's, like, it's how you communicate to your players. Yeah. Now, Jabs, what would you as a player expect from a coach in terms of the communication and all of that from, from a selection point of view? I think the, the key words that, that players often use is they, they say they want uh, transparency, honesty, and... Uh, it's it's important also to note that that from a player's perspective, sometimes we we can't handle that, right? But also from a coach's perspective, the how we deliver that I think becomes the important question and point to raise. As an example, so if you wanting if the player or the the initial conversation that you're having between player and and coach, and you're saying right, I want you to be honest with me. Uh, let's say on selection, right? I wasn't happy with you, so if I'm going to say Shane, right, that was a shit shot as an example. But now, obviously, as a coach, I'm trying to get the best out of you. So 
sometimes I've got to go the route of, right, Shane, maybe I need to alter my question here. Shane, do you think there's a different option that we could have used? And all of a sudden, the approach in that moment allows for easier growth and easier acknowledgement with, within the points you're trying to, trying to make. And I think everybody that has been on or is on this call will acknowledge that in their coaching careers already, that that is such a crucial component, being able to identify the personality and knowing, right, how do I get the best out of this guy right now in terms of my conversation? And the reality is you will have guys that need to kick up the ass. Sometimes you need to say, right, that was a shit shot. I need better from you. And all of a sudden, because of the personality, you have the response, which is a good one. But we, what we don't want as coaches is a, a certain language being used and all of a sudden you don't get the right response. So again, that, that for me, uh, in my limited experience as a coach, my thinking on that will be a trial and error process. I, and if I had to throw that back to you, I mean, you would have had experiences of walking back and uh, thinking to yourself, hey, maybe I didn't handle that situation well enough. Um, even, even having conversations with somebody like Gary Kirsten, um, an experienced coach, play, uh, coach at the highest level, he often speaks about how there be, there'd be certain moments where he realized he could have done things differently. So we're not perfect by, by no means, but I think the important thing is to continue that journey of, um, of learning and, and observing personalities in your side to get the best out of them. Yeah, and it, it's, it's something that, that was mentioned yesterday. I think for coming at it from a coaching perspective again, Two things that, that, that are very common things that come out of a player is, coach, I expect you to be honest with me and coach, I want good communication. That for me is, 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 is a very generalized, those are the two things that come out quite often. Mm. And, and my questions I always throw back to them is, is communication is a two-way street just to cover communication. But more importantly, honesty is, is if you want me to be honest with you, can you accept my honesty? And I think um, for me as a coach, my challenge there is, how do I facilitate a conversation with that player that will ultimately be able to give him that honest feedback. But I don't want to lose that player at the same time. So yeah. there for me, there's a, key, there's a key element of really understanding that player mm. and not just understanding him as a cricketer, but understanding him as a person. Um, and that takes time and that takes trial and error, as you mentioned. And I mm. think that is the key in that. So the two words I put down there is, is transparency and honesty and selection. I think if you can engage players and they can see the bigger picture and they can see that um, the coach isn't necessarily picking favorites because of, of character, he's actually picking according to his vision and his strategy, I think then you get the general buy-in of the whole team. Mm. Um, and, and for me, those are two key words. And funny enough, those are two words that you mentioned, JP, right, yeah. right from the offset. Another key to all of this is, is using or well, utilizing data to inform decision making. Now, coaching has involved, well, evolved a, a hell of a lot over the last five years. And what we're tending to see now is video analysts coming in the game, not that they haven't been there before those five years, they've always been there, but coming in, um, having these technical um, guys that are coming in and using data to really give you information to facilitate uh, conversations. For me, the key is as a coach, you have two eyes. And, 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 and that is the most important um, uh, assets you can have as a coach is your two eyes to actually see what is being delivered. Um, my, my, my advice to you there is always use data to just inform your decision making. And every coach will want to be seeing different things from data, um, but utilize it because I think you can, it can give you an advantage, a competitive advantage, but just be really smart with the data that you use, but never underestimate how important it is to actually watch and analyze from, from a distance sometimes. So just to add to that chain, uh, it's, it's actually tied into the question that was posed by Jean Saliers, and I think you answered it anyway, but just to add on to that, he's saying how much does data statistics play a role in your game plan? And, mm -hmm. and just to add, it does play a, a, play a role, but again, you know, and again, the, the answer that I'm gonna give, or the point I'm gonna make is, is a little bit high level in terms of my experience of players, because we have access to unlimited data, there will be players that actually wouldn't want to see anything as opposed from the, uh, with regards to the opposition. But all of a sudden, they just want to look at themselves. They want to see themselves doing good things. So it's almost affirming themselves in their own brain as they're watching. They're getting this affirmation, right? I'm good enough. I can do this. But then on the other side of it, 
and this was probably where, where I lent to was I needed to see what bowlers were trying to do. I needed to see the shape of the ball. I needed to see when was he going to be bowling a certain length at a certain time on certain conditions. Whereas a Quentin de Kock was not interested in that. All he wanted to do was, was watch himself. And he will have an understanding because he would have played against players before. And, okay, if you get the ball there, I'm going to do that, that, and that. And that was as simple as it was for him. But now the important thing as a coach in that scenario, I think it's important to use that data and statistics, right? For you to watch that and almost go have a conversation in maybe in pre-practice, like with the, with the players, Quentin de Kock, right? I was, I, was, I was thinking about Mitchell Stark and he looks to do this at certain times. And I was wondering, uh, how, do you, how do you respond to that? And then all of a sudden you're engaging in a conversation because now he's reinforcing, no, but I like to do this and this and that. And all of a sudden as a coach, that's a learning moment for you as well because you're engaging in a conversation that you are learning from the player. And I, and I think we mustn't, uh, at no point must we, must we look past the fact that we can also learn from players in those moments. Absolutely. So I, I remember during my playing career, I certainly learned more from, from the players around me that I probably did from, from, from coaching staff. And that's no disrespect to the coaching staff. I yeah. think just because players are constantly <clears throat> having conversations, you know, about, about the opposition. And that, that also ties into Jean's first question he asked about, um, you know, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you identify strengths and weaknesses in other, other teams? And that's, I think that's something that always happens. You know, I just mentioned earlier that there's no more secrets. You know, all this information and all this data is out there for anybody to view at any point. Um, it's just about how you utilize it um, and, and, and how coaches utilize it to best inform decision making. But, yep. um, but I think, yeah, just to emphasize that point, uh, the players around you can, 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 you can really pick up a hell of a lot from them too. Moving into planning, and this is uh, step number three. So the first thing in terms of planning is, and it's a very important point for me, is, is in your planning, there's got to be a real work ethic and a drive for you to get this strategy and this vision across. It's not going to be easy. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of effort. Um, and understand that you have to look forward to that effort as a coach. I mentioned yesterday as a coach, your, your coaching hours don't, don't necessarily go from a nine to five. And for all you coaches out there, you understand what I mean. Sometimes you've got to go over and beyond. And quite often it's that, um, that time and that energy and that effort that people don't see that actually makes the biggest difference at the end of the day. And that could also go as a player, you know, that run you go for early in the morning. People don't necessarily see that. They might post it on social media, but uh, be careful the guys that don't post it and they don't actually want you to know about it. I think um, for me, there's a certain work ethic and a drive that has to go into planning. Um, a big point I really want to emphasize is, is sometimes we're searching for that ultimate answer or that little nugget that might seem so far-fetched. Just don't forget that simple can be good. Simple can be adequate. Okay, Sometimes the simple things really work very well. Um, I would rather, rather you try to get um, four or five of the simple things right than go and search for this, this golden nugget and you forget about those simple things and you actually don't focus on those steps. Okay. Other thing for me is being ahead of the game. Don't leave any stone left unturned. And, and for me, if I simplify that, it's about having no regrets. Okay, it's very easy to say that because I think um, it's very easy to have regrets, um, things you didn't do. But I think in your planning process, try to try avoid um, not looking at certain things. And we just mentioned data. Rather look at the data. Take the data in, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to utilize it. But make sure you're looking at it. Make sure you're going about it and you're trying to find that extra little bit of um, that extra energy or whatever it might be that might just work. Big thing that we mentioned yesterday was initiating conversations. Now, as part of your planning process, initiating conversations might be with your very own coaching staff. It might be with your very own players. It actually might be with players or coaches outside of your system um, that might even help initiate um, uh, those conversations and help your planning process. I think it's very important to include players in the planning process. And um, and Japes, uh, as a player, this is where I'm going to bring bring you in. How much did you value um, having input into into a process like this? No, hugely, because you you felt part of of uh, of the process that you're trying to to follow, the game plan you're trying to follow, uh, and you felt. You felt connected to the team, 
you you felt like you were adding value outside of just your runs and your wickets and so forth. And I think that's an important thing for for any player to feel. They they must feel part of it. And and, and a big part of as as I'm sure every everyone on the platform will will attest to. When you have new players coming in, um, you, you immediately want them to feel part of the environment. And how do you do that? You include them in the process, include them in conversation, you initiate conversations with them, get their input in terms of their, whether it be limited or high experiences, um, depending on age and where they've been, but you include them and never feel, uh, I, I guess you never want to, to make people feel like you know it all. And we've said that from the start, it's always, Let's learn from one another, and that's an important thing for me. The next, the next thing on that list is, <clears throat> is there actually a good review process and a feedback process? Um, and again, it's about understanding your audience and understanding your players and your crowd that you might have in front of you. Um, I know in a South African system, you can walk in and um, stand in front of a group of people and get your, your thoughts across, and, and quite often you will get that energy back from them. That engage, you know, those those players are engaged straight away because I think it's very much part of our culture as South Africans. Mm. I think if you go into different um, cultures, I find sometimes that doesn't necessarily work, um, and and you might have to approach it in a bit of a different way. So so maybe you need to get people into smaller groups. Maybe you need to have more individual conversations with them, and how you go about doing that, I think, is 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 completely up to you, and it is part of the art of coaching and the art of, of, of sensing and, 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 and working out characters. So, but, but just remember that I think reviewing what you are doing is always important, whether that might be after training, before games, after games, how you go about doing that, I think is a process you have to figure out for yourself. So Jake, I've got a, I've got a yeah. question for you, Shane, around that. And, and I'll be, I'm actually going to pose that, this question to all coaches as well, maybe to just type it in the, in the text box is, if you think of review and feedback after games, where do you like to do a, a sort of holistic analysis of the game? Do you like to do it directly after or do you like it to be a case of processing first and then maybe review the next day or the next uh, practice session? Um, be interesting to hear your thoughts around that in the, in the comment box. But I want to pose that to you, Shane. Um, and I, I'm very fascinated about this because my personal opinion, again, I'm limited in terms of my experience as a coach. But from a playing experience, I hated reviews directly mm -hmm. after a game because emotions are so high. If the coach is not emotionally uh, almost intelligent enough or qualified mm -hmm. enough to be able to, man, uh, to, to manage that process well enough without screaming and shouting and so forth, I believe you lose players, and, and I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, you do get a small group of players that respond well to that. But I think it was always important for me as, a, as looking at a coach, you've got to analyze whether am I doing this right now to air my frustrations, or is this going to benefit the team? So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's one that we could speak about for a hell of a long time, and I'm really looking forward to seeing a few comments on the side there because we're all going to have different ideas on this. I, you mentioned a word there, or two words, emotional intelligence. I think for me, that, 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 that is the key right there. Are you emotionally intelligent enough as a coach to identify how you need to give feedback to your players? Um, if you're going to bring ego into it and it's going to all become all about you as a coach, I think that's where the walls go up from players. And, and, and you'll, you'll tend to lose them more often than not. People speak a lot about the, the Fergie hairdryer treatment and everything else. But let's remember that that was in a day and age where, 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 where Fergie might have understood that that's what the team required at the time. One of the best feedback sessions I ever had from a playing point of view, we, we, we played probably one of our worst games. And, and we were all sitting there worried about what the coach was going to say when he walked in. And all he did on this particular day, the coach walked in put a couple of beers down in front of us, didn't force us to drink the beers we drank, you know, if, if you don't want to drink something else, you could. And he just said, guys, tough pull to swallow, but have a beer. And, 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 and what that did was that actually encouraged all of us to, to, to A, get together, but B, start chatting about cricket, not necessarily the loss, but that actually brought us closer together as a team than, than you might ever imagine. And for me, that was a stroke of genius in terms of a feedback session from the coach. He didn't have to say one word, but what he did is he created an environment of support for all of us 
and we and we had conversations and and many old school teams would have done that obviously now it's changed with 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 fines meetings and all that sort of stuff but um i just want to yeah carefully think about how you review and how you give players feedback because i think um that's crucial and a very important point so please put some comments on the side there guys mm. some good feedback uh, so Jabs, you can just, just, just read a little bit of that, that feedback and then I'm gonna just carry on with teamwork here while we go. Um yeah. so guys, the fourth the fourth uh, the step four of the of the five step process is is actually teamwork, getting down to the the hard work of actually doing it together as a team. Now again we mentioned uh, players' input, but I think it's important even during teamwork um to actually engage players for the input and, and we've obviously mentioned the, the the reasons why already. Crucial to create a senior core or a leadership group. Now, many of you might say, yes, but I coach the Taurus A team at school. Now, how am I going to do that? I've got a lot of youngsters. Now, for me, leadership at a younger age is actually about throwing it around and trying to identify your leaders. Yes, you're doing that at a senior level and you can create a senior core and you want to, you want a leadership core probably of different characters and different thinking. You don't want a leadership core that all necessarily think the same way because I think as a coach, you shouldn't be scared to be challenged in the right way or have a sort of a different way of thinking. And I think the more you can encourage that from a senior core, the more that can, that can go throughout your team. Yeah. Crucial for me, especially being involved in international cricket is, is the value of players leading the values or the rules or whatever other words you might use. Um, once players take ownership of it and they start enforcing it within the team and you aren't seen to be the disciplinarian in the team, I think then that has real power and real value in your team. Um, players can call each other out then, not necessarily always on negative things, but also positive things. And I think that really brings a nice balance within your team. I think it's also impor important to engage players and to really find out more about their personality and their character, which we've already touched on a little bit. Try and understand their types, or even, you know, many of us might have professionals that we can use at our disposal. I mean, nowadays you can go online and you can do a simple Myers-Briggs test for the player, which will get you to understand whether he's introverted, extroverted, and how you can use that to your advantage. Um, and I think the key for me is really, are you going over and beyond and trying to find out as much as you can about your players? Because they are all different and they all take information in different ways. JP spoke earlier about how he took in information. He was a very, he wanted to to see those bowlers and what it would look like running it. So he was a very visual sort of person. Quinny was obviously very different. And then you get some players who aren't worried about that at all. They want to know about the data and the stats and everything else. So, so for me, that's about understanding what your players really require and trying to give them that. Cool. Anything on there, Jace, that you just want to touch on? Yeah, just a question to you quickly. I mean, on teamwork and, and creating a, a good cohesion within your side on and off the field, um, Interestingly, in my own experiences of activities that we've done uh, as a team that would enhance teamwork um, and also getting to know guys off the field, have you had similar experience with the coach? Yeah, I think uh, you'll be amazed somewhere sometimes where you get to know know your players. You know, I think it's not always at a training session. It's not always at uh, during games where under pressure, that's where you get to know your players. But I think there's various different environments that you can also get to know your players. And again, it comes down to the skill of, do you have that emotional intelligence as a coach to really identify how you get that information out of players or how you get to identify what they are as characters? So, you know, one of the ways I've found that works quite nicely is a simple game of golf sometimes um, can, can teach you a hell of a lot about a player, the way they, they, they handle themselves on a the golf course, not necessarily the way they hit the ball and all of that because, because we all know golf's a tough game, but, um, but just the way they handle themselves and the sort of you've got four hours to have a conversation with them on a golf course. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating you need to go out and play golf, but that was certainly one of the ways. But there's very uh, many other ways. You know, sometimes sitting down and having a, a cup of coffee with a player. Maybe you've got a young person who, who has traveled many, many hours to get to a training session and just the offer of a lift to a place or something like that could be an opportunity for you to have a conversation with that player. And I mm -hmm. think you taking an interest in that person's life you will mm. you will get a hell of a lot back from that player. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to try something different, if you don't mind, Shane. Um, there was a really good point made or question asked by, is it Fossey? Did you say Fossey? Fossey, yeah, that's it. Um, I don't know if you can put on your mic, Fossey, and maybe you want to just uh, share this comment. Um, does a senior 
core leadership group jeopardize confidentiality? Different people have different friendship groups. Maybe just share your insights into that. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Hi. Hi, Bert. Hey, JP. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I think I think my, my question stems from probably having noticed um, over the last few years, uh, particularly within the Australian setup, I've got extensive experience having lived and coached there for seven years, yeah. um, where the, the leadership group or the senior group has come under a lot of scrutiny with the sandpaper um, debacle that took place. And clearly there was a break in confidentiality and for that matter communication because nobody of the senior core group really took ownership or responsibility, although I believe the whole leadership group carried knowledge of what was going to be executed during the playing time. So hence my question. When you have a leadership group, we all have different friends, friends, and we move in different friendship circles. How hard is it to really know that when you as a coach have mm. confidential discussions, whether it would be about the particular individual or teammates, when it starts affecting selection or player performance or attitude or fitness levels, how do we manage to ensure that that confidentiality chain does not get broken because I think it's a human characteristic where people want to protect their mates mm. and want to give them their heads up so they can rectify instead of being addressed. Thanks for the opportunity, mates. Sure. Well, see, uh, thanks, thanks for your question, and um, and I hate to say that you're getting a bit of an Australian accent, but but nonetheless, I, I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's been a long time. I played a lot of cricket with Fossi, but Fossi, you've you bring up a very valid point. Um, and the first thing I wanna, I wanna mention is, I think in this day and age, one of the hardest things is, 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 is actually down to managing social media. Because I think there's so much um, now, you know, so many platforms for players to speak, to, to, to maybe um, to, sh to show their emotions, to show their feelings. And I think more often than not, social media can be um, destructive, but it can also be a positive thing too. Key thing for me in all of that, for see, it comes down to trust. You know, if I, if I genuinely can trust my support staff, and I believe leadership starts right at the top, if I'm expecting certain behaviors in my team, I cannot be going against those behaviors as a person and, and, and more importantly, in, in, in the actions that I show. If I'm going against my non-negotiables, how can I be a leader of that team? Because I can't be expecting them to be doing, to, to, to maybe to, to show me trust if I'm not willing to show them trust back. So I think it works both ways. And again, it goes into really identifying and having the emotional intelligence to identify who those leaders might be. And more often than not, us as leaders, we, we, when we get challenged, we sometimes retract or we go into our shells. And I think we have to embrace being challenged as long as we're being challenged in the right way for the best of the team. Because mm. every decision has to be the best for the team. Mm. And um, if you bring ego into play again, I think that's where you... You, you sometimes get it wrong. Um, Jabes, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Just quickly, because I know that we, we, we're running short of time, just to yeah. add to that is, um, I think it's important as, as, as you as the coach or even just the captain in that relationship to identify the roles of that core leadership group. So it's almost like you get specific tasks for various players in that group and, and, and you're gonna fulfill that. So in terms of uh, making sure that you manage expectations around that confidentiality, I think when you, when you come to confidential things within a team environment, I think that's when your management needs to step to the fore as opposed to your leadership group in terms of players. I think you've got to be very specific in what your uh, sort of targets are, your tangible outcomes from your, your leadership group in terms of players because they're driving certain values uh, and, and, and non-negotiables. But when it comes to dealing with personalities, individuals within a team, I think you've got to be very careful that you almost stick to your, maybe captain can be involved in that, but again, it depends on the level you're coaching, but most certainly uh, towards your management group, I think that's probably the safest route, in, in my opinion, at least. Brilliant, and I think we're just going to move on just so we can get through these five steps, uh, guys. We are under a little bit of time pressure. Um, and I'm just going to put them all on the screen just to, just to save a little bit of time. So the fifth thing is actually we're going into your training. Okay, now you've gone, uh, you've got this vision, you've spoken about your strategy and your tactics. 
um, all the planning has gone into in, in, into play. Uh, you, you've worked together as a team now. It actually comes down to your training and, and how you implement all of that. I think the key is, and we spoke about it yesterday, is you need to train as, if, as, as how you would like to play. Um, and I think that goes without saying. Training needs to be challenging under pressure to improve. And we spoke yesterday again about training hard, playing easy. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll just refer back to that documentary, Chasing the Sun, once again, where the players said the training sessions were of such a high intensity that they found when they got into games, it actually felt a lot more comfortable. Um, sometimes the training sessions were actually harder than what the games felt like. And I think there's a lot of power in that. Um, and that's something just to take on board. Um, very important to have constant communication around your game plans and your tactics. And um, if you really want your, your game plan to come together and your vision to come together, I think you have to be very smart with the conversations that you have having at the training sessions, whether that is before, during training or even after, I think you have to be really smart as we've mentioned about communication already. And then the last thing, and let's, let's never forget, training needs to be enjoyable. Um, if, if training is not enjoyable, uh, your players will not want to come to training. They will not want to go over and beyond. And I think uh, when that happens, then you, you can't ultimately um, bring out your, your game plan or your vision that you might have had. So come up with, with different ways of making training enjoyable. And, and, um, and, and again, it's trial and error. Don't be scared to, to try a few different things and see what your players enjoy. Um, to just have a quick recap of it, guys, Past step process, um, vision, strategy and tactics, planning, teamwork and training. I've tried to go into a bit of a, a game plan cycle, which might just actually make things even a little bit easier for everyone. And I think this is a cycle and we almost finished, guys, and then we're going to take a few questions. This is a cycle that you can utilize and it's, it's, it's pretty much a performance cycle. Um, nothing new, nothing you haven't seen before. But I think um, the first thing is to identify what we want to do. The second thing is to strategize and, and put those game plans and tactics and everything else that we spoke about into play. Um, the third thing is your, your, your general preparation. Good preparation means good results. Um, that goes into your performances. Now, whether those performances are good or bad, um, sometimes you can't control that, but hopefully in, in being really consistent with, with, your, with your, 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 your identification, your strategy and your preparation, more often than not, your performances will be, will be good. And then the final thing, as we've already mentioned, is reviewing all of that, okay? And hopefully that, that, that brings you your desired outcome that you ultimately wanted to achieve. And for me, that's a constant circle that keeps going around, that's never ending. JP mentioned, you know, what next after winning a World Cup for us here, Rasmus? And I'm sure the legacy he wants to leave is that that cycle, yes, it needs to start again, but that continued success needs to carry on going. And, and that ultimately is... Is, is, is an answer we might never have as to how that continuously goes around in a circle uh, and how we keep achieving success. Um, but what do they say? If you keep doing the same things, you get the same results. So sometimes you've got to try a couple of different things. Um, Jake, just anything on that just before we, we go into questions? No, I think, I think that's a, a great simple way of identifying that, that cycle that can be repeated. And, and again, it's, it's not the gospel in many ways, but it, it it is a nice framework to work with and uh, and you can add or take out as you see fit because that will be broken down into various uh, compartments so so that's good yeah we can i mean there's there's a few questions that we can can look into mm -hmm. um and then and then we can take it from there we're yeah. going to go into to questions but jay you just got your little quote just before we go into questions yeah it's just simply there's no such thing as the perfect game plan it requires a good process and execution for it to be effective and I, I for those of you who were on the call yesterday i mentioned this quote from general dwight eisenhower where he says i have found that in battle that plans are useless but planning is indispensable and and, and i really enjoy that because it's important to plan it's it really is important and to have an idea of what you're trying to achieve and by t by going through the process of the planning when you get to that moment of planning sorry of of trying to execute that game plan if it if if it needs to be altered in some way or you see it works you know you have then the know-how and the preparation that you've put in now through this planning process to be able to identify what what will work and what doesn't work so yeah it's important um to understand that it might not always work but it's important to go through the process of putting it together 
spot on. Guys, we're gonna we're gonna take some questions and I've just looked at the time and it's amazing how how quickly time goes by. We've been we've been chatting here for over an hour already. Um so thank you very much. Please please keep your questions coming. I'm sure um, Mikey won't mind uh, the, the disciplinarian in, in Mikey will give us five minutes here just to have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the first one, and I, I'm willing to take just just while we might be waiting for a few more questions. Uh, someone when ma made mention of Mahela Jai Wardena Japes coming in as a very young and inexperienced coach, probably out of play, mm -hmm. and he achieved the sort of success that he did. Now I know it's a coaching question, but if I throw it over to you. Um, how do you think he managed to do that? And you spoke a lot about engaging with those stakeholders. Mm. But how, how, how do you think he managed to do it as a, as a, as a coach, an inexperienced coach? He had the right people around him. So yeah. again, it, it was, it's important to note that um, the resources in a team like that are, it's unlimited, you know. So he managed to get the right people in various departments around him where all he needed to do was manage the process. And if you a good manager, and, and obviously he has the, the skills in terms of him um, going through that process of playing and, and achieving what he <clears> did. <throat> he would have that experience to share with everyone. But he just got the right people around him that and, and the right players because he had powerful players in that or still has powerful players in that team that really put in consistent performances and the right support staff around him to enhance those performances. Hold on. Um, Right, Mikey, I'm going to bring you in and you can you can just, just pose a few questions to us from the panel and I'm going to allow you to then manage the time from here on in. Okay, should I? <laughs> Where'd you get another rap on the knuckles? Then? <laughs> I haven't actually been following the questions. It sounds like you guys have been following the questions, so that's why I was quite happy the way you were doing it. Right, yes, yeah, so if, if you want me to... Um, yeah, keep... Wait on the jokes, you, you... Yeah, uh, I don't know how to pronounce Aya Bongwa, I think it is. I uh, call him Aya and he was smiling at that last time, so stick with Aya. How do you make a game plan with different types of players, example, boundary hitters, strike rotators, or attacking bowlers and defensive bowlers? Uh, Shane, how would you look at that from a coach's view? Um, yeah, I think, again, it goes back to identifying what are your strengths as a team? You know, um, what players have got have you got at your disposal? If you've got if you've got a lot of power hitters, whether they're left or right handed, you know, how, how do you put them in a batting order that it's going to ultimately mean winning more games uh, than not? You know, I think um, looking at your bowling attack, how do you structure it? Yesterday we spoke about the value of having someone that can bowl overs for you and still bat in the top six. The mm -hmm. value of having a wicket keeper that can bat in the top order and keep. You know, someone like Quinton de Kock becomes very valuable because what Quinton does is he might open up another space for you to pick someone else who you think might have that little bit of extra that might win you a game of cricket. So, again, it comes down to every coach um, sees challenges about balancing that and finding what the right combinations might be. And more often than not, you're, you're, you necessarily won't have the, the same combinations. If we were all going to pick a World Eleven team now, I can guarantee you it, it's completely different. So, so we all have our opinions, but it's engaging with those guys around you to pick the right combinations. Mm. No, spot on. And then uh, there's a question by Total Cricket. You speak about uh, the tactics, strategy, game plans of how the team wants to play. How do you orchestrate the mentality of the team? And I, I, mm -hmm. if, if that's okay, Shane, I, I'd answer this okay. one. It, I think it relates to your team culture. Um, so yesterday we spoke a little bit about team culture, but something that I that I didn't mention, which if I had to explain team culture to somebody and the simplest way that I can uh, put it that really speaks to me and maybe maybe hopefully to you as well, is a way of thinking that transcends into consistent behaviors. So if we're thinking about mentality, mentality is, is up here in the mind, it's, it's thinking. So how do we create a an environment uh, and we're constantly having this conversation about the way we think, but then transcends into behaviors. What are the actions that we're going to do that is going to put this into action? You know what I mean? And, and be consistent with it. And I think that is an important one in terms of orchestrating that mentality. It starts with good conversation. It starts with you as a coach as facilitating uh, those conversations. And then ultimately, you've got to be driving uh, throughout, whether it's practice sessions, whether it's off-field stuff, 
you've got to be driving those behaviors consistently and being an example of it and your core leaders in the group being an example of it because there will be constant check-ins with those leaders right what do we need to do to enhance our environment what do we need to do to enhance our culture who do we need to engage who do we need to look after consistently and that is behaviors and i believe that that is what orchestrates the mentality of the team and the desired outcome there would be creating a consistency isn't it yeah a consistency in performance behaviors mentality and i think any team for me i like seeing a team that's consistent yeah. um I don't like the up and down nature of teams when they're winning the up in the clouds when they're losing the down there. For me, for me, a team needs to be very level headed, and 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 what the way JP's just explained that is is the process of of doing that. Mm. Do you want to take the last question? Is asking, do you have a plan B or C ready to go if plan A isn't working on the day, or do you just adjust during the match and then pass on the information? Again, it goes down into your training and our players have trained. Um, your captain obviously makes the calls on the game uh, or during a game. And I think uh, key key that the captain is very much in tune with a game plan. Um, but also I think as a cricketer, it's about taking ownership, you know, especially when you're at the highest level, to take ownership onto your own two shoulders about, I personally have a plan A, I personally have a plan B and C if things maybe aren't going right. Um, so it's about engaging with all your players, having those conversations, giving them ownership to take it on. And then when they're on the field, when you're sitting on the side of the field as a coach, you do not have a remote control. You can't sit there and press buttons. And yeah. I think um, if you've trained well and you've had those conversations prior to tournament um, action or performances or whatever you might want to call it, more yeah. often than not, those players will have a plan B and C. Spot on. Well, I think um, those are all the questions, I think. I think that's it. Yeah. So guys, just from my side, maybe just to, to finish off. And again, I look at the time. It's crazy how time goes by. Um, fantastic to see familiar faces. Um, really, really enjoying these because it, uh, it creates good conversation. And, and as we go through them, I just find it just energizes me. You know, I got off, I got off the webinar, webinar yesterday and I felt really energized to want to get out and coach, which I think in a time like this during COVID and everything, when we're sitting at home and we don't have much to do, you know, this really gives me a real energy. So I actually want to thank everybody who's come on the call because mm -hmm. um, I really, I really have enjoyed it. That, that, that's it from me, guys. Yeah, just to add, thank you. Appreciate your, your insights, your thoughts, particularly in the text box. And again, uh, it's great to, to see different opinions on, on how to deal with different situations because it's not about one fits all. I think it's an opportunity for all of us to learn so great. Thank you, man. Yeah, but that's um, that's not going to be the end of it. Um, I, I have a little thing that I'm going to announce again at the end of it because um, once again I've managed to twist these two guys' arms, um, and we've we're going to be doing that, um, or I'm going to be doing that a lot um, for them. And um, yeah, they've they've managed to once again open up some more more slots for us, so it doesn't just end here. The coaching does continue. Um, when we first discuss, discussed um, these topics um, with, with Shane and JP, it was, you know, what, what topics should we cover? Uh, because, you know, if we're just talking about game plans on its own, we could discuss it for a whole week. Um, if we really wanted to, to get down to the details, um, or as the, the nuts and the bolts, as Shane calls it, um, you know, to really, really go and break it down beyond, beyond that. Um, and what we what we've decided to do is to to open things up a little bit further so if you are wanting sort of individual attention and things like that we, we can get get through to that so i'm going to just um bring up my screen a little bit just to show you the opportunities that that, that lie within that as well okay so um i'm just going to share yeah, so shane and jp have been very um very kind and very open um to 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 giving up their time so to speak um and and it's the same as similar office to what we had yesterday obviously this is very specific to sort of game plans okay so three offer number one that they were sort of willing to bring, present and bring forward is sort of three one hour group calls okay covering game planning so that's an additional three hours on this topic goes significantly deeper into the details so there'll only be a maximum of 10 people on that 
cool. So they'll allow a lot more engagement and it's going to be a lot more of a two-way Zoom call. Um, it's it's going to be questions and answers and, and it's not going to be such a, a, a webinar from Shane and JP. It's going to be a lot more open. Let's discuss and talk about your game plans and, and really giving you that sort of help that you need within that, within that group and bouncing ideas of one another. So um, a good three hours with these guys would normally cost you about, in a group setting like that, would cost about 500 rand an hour. Um, but obviously, we in our launch week, so we're going to be giving that 50% discount. It's going to be 250 rand per hour um, for that. That's those three sessions there. Offer number two is a one, one times two-hour private call with them helping you with your game plan. So that's just yourself um, on your own. Talking with these two legends, um, giving you individual help and attention on your game plans. And, and if at the end of the two hours that you're still needing anything, if there's anything else you're wanting to discuss, if there's time for that, um, you're welcome to do that with them as well. And there are only three spots available for this. Normal one-on-one -on -one prices with these two guys and, and legends of this caliber is, is normally about two grand an hour. Okay, but again, this is our launch week, so we're giving it away at a special. It's going to be 1,600 Rand for the two hours. Okay, that's nothing to get um, international players and coaches helping you with your individual game plans for your teams for the season. So um, that's, I think, is a bargain there. Offer number three is everything in offer number two. So you'll get your individual, your two-hour talk with them plus you get entry into the mentorship mastermind group okay there are only five spots in the mastermind group so what the mastermind group is basically a mentorship uh, having your own personal coaching mentorship with jp and shane throughout this is an annual process it's normally 40 grand for a year to be following and having these guys as your personal mentors Again, we're cutting it down. That's about a 60% discount there. It's only 15,000 Rand, plus minus 15,000 Rand. Um, the, the charges come through in US dollars, you'll see on the page. So that's an estimate at the moment. The US dollar is doing very badly, so it's even less than 15,000. Um, but it's an annual membership. So you'll have Shane and JP as your personal mentors for a year. And that breaks down to having sort of, it gets broken down into fours, into quarters, and you'll be able to have chat with these guys and the other five members in the group as to what you should be doing with your team through those stages, each stage of the year as you're going through and being able to, to call on Shane and JP with, with any problems that you might be having um, within the year. That's uh, how, to, how would they deal with it? How should they handle these things? I think that's a brilliant thing to be able to have these guys in your back pocket. Okay, so um, just to look at them side by side, there's offer number one, the, the three, three one hour sessions in the group. Okay, so that works out to about 750 Rand. You've got the one two hour private call. Okay, there's only three spots available for that, and it's 1,600 Rand. And there's also still covering game plans and, and tactics for creating game plans, as Shane's discussed it today. And then there's um, offer number two plus the Mastermind Mentorship Group at 15 Rand. Okay, so you can head over to the website. It's at the bottom over there, jp21coaching.com forward slash game plan offers. If you're interested in any of those, if you're wanting to take game plans a little bit deeper um, with these two guys, um, you can head over to there and, and have a look. It all works through PayPal, so you will need a PayPal account in order to, to make payments, um, and the payments do come through in US dollars, so you'll just need to do your conversions for those of you from the UK um, and, and have a look at there. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that there and I'm going to say my goodbyes as well. And once again, thank you very much to everybody that's come. Um, yeah, it is great seeing, seeing so many faces and seeing familiar faces again. It means that um, these two gents that are, are next to me are, are doing a fabulous job seeing the numbers growing every week as well. Every, every day, shall I say. Cool, JP, Shane, thank you very much once again. It's been, you guys have been brilliant. You've been awesome. Um, I've loved it, listening to, to things as well. Um, now knowing, knowing what you guys do and, and seeing it happen um, and, and, and seeing the processes now actually on paper, it makes a lot of sense as to what happens in the change room, Shane, when um, I've been next to you there. So good job. All right, thanks everybody. Have a good one and hopefully we'll see you all again tomorrow.
Cheers, guys. Thanks for everything. Cheers. Thanks, Abe. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow.